What does alcohol do to your body? What does it do to the liver? The brain. And why does it cause those symptoms that you see in people that are intoxicated or drunk? And is there a safe amount of alcohol that people can ingest? If so, how much? Well, in today's video, we're gonna answer all of these questions and more. So let's just jump right into it. The type of alcohol that us humans ingest is ethyl alcohol or ethanol, but I'll just refer to it as alcohol from here on out. When we ingest and swallow the alcohol, it will move down the esophagus and into the stomach. Now if I open this other stomach, you can see the inside lining or the mucosal lining of the stomach. The reason I'm showing you this is because some of the alcohol can actually be absorbed through the stomach lining and into the bloodstream. However, this is only a small amount, but it is important to note that alcohol absorption and how fast it enters your bloodstream does depend on the contents of the stomach, meaning that alcohol is absorbed more quickly on an empty stomach. If, for example, there's fat and protein in the stomach, this will slow that small amount that can be absorbed through the stomach, and of more significance, this will also slow gastric emptying, essentially slowing the movements of the contents from the stomach into the small intestine. And the small intestine is where the majority of alcohol is absorbed. Once the alcohol is absorbed from the stomach and the small intestine, it will go directly to this large organ here, the liver. And many of you have likely already heard that the liver does the majority of the work to detoxify the body from the alcohol. But understanding how the liver exactly does this is important because this will help us to understand some of the potential negative consequences of alcohol intake. So again, once the alcohol is absorbed into the blood from the small intestine and a little bit from the stomach, all the blood vessels from these organs are going to funnel in to a vein called the hepatic portal vein. Hepatic just means liver. Now as the blood passes into the liver, much of that alcohol will move into the liver cells called hepatocytes in order to be metabolized. And that's what we have with our brown rectangle here. It's representing our liver cell or our hepatocyte. Obviously not to scale, but you get the idea. And the first conversion that's gonna take place is that alcohol will be converted into something called acetaldehyde, and this requires the use of an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase, as well as a cofactor called NAD. You can see the NAD going in and coming out as NADH. And these enzymes and cofactors will actually be important for our discussion in just a second, and actually for the remainder of the video, so keep them in the back of your mind. But it is interesting to note that the acetaldehyde is actually more toxic than the alcohol itself, and plays a huge role in some of the negative impacts of alcohol. So this next conversion by the liver cells is obviously going to be quite important. The liver cells then convert the acetaldehyde into acetate, which requires another enzyme called aldehyde dehydrogenase as well as another NAD. And this step actually occurs within the mitochondria, and as an FYI, the first step occurred within the cytosol of the liver cell. Acetate can then actually be utilized as energy. This will require some more steps, but nonetheless, this is a much better option than having the toxic acetaldehyde building up in the liver. However, again, the reason I'm mentioning these enzymes and this cofactor NAD is because these will be important when we have situations of ingesting high levels of alcohol and or chronic use of alcohol. I guess a little bit of a spoiler alert would be that we're going to find that we can overwhelm these systems, which can have some negative effects on the body. But I do wanna come back to when we absorb alcohol through the small intestine, as well as that small amount through the stomach. Yes, the blood coming from those organs does go directly to the liver, but not all the alcohol will be able to move from the bloodstream and into those liver cells with the first pass of blood. So that means some unmetabolized alcohol will be able to circulate throughout the body before passing through the liver again. Some of this will reach places that can directly get rid of the alcohol. For example, about 5% of alcohol can be excreted through the kidneys, sweat glands, and even through the lungs, which is how you can smell alcohol in someone's breath and how the alcohol breathalyzer test can detect alcohol. But as the alcohol circulates throughout the rest of the body, it can freely pass into the cells. And obviously, some of these cells are neurons that make up the brain. When alcohol reaches the brain, it affects multiple areas. And we'll look at a few different areas that help to explain some of the commonly observed effects of alcohol. The first that we'll discuss is the prefrontal cortex, which is this area of the brain. The prefrontal cortex is involved in multiple activities, but to name a few things like reasoning, thinking, planning, judgment, and impulse control. Suppressing this area of the brain with alcohol explains why people often say and do things that they may not normally do if they were not otherwise drinking alcohol. The hippocampus is another area affected by alcohol. 
and one of its functions is to form and store short-term memory, which explains alcohol's effects on memory and even the so-called blackouts that people experience at higher levels of alcohol intake. Next is the cerebellum, which is this beautiful looking portion of the brain, and this coordinates movement and balance and many other things, but I'm sure you're not going to be surprised that alcohol affecting this area of the brain explains why people can stumble, lose their balance and coordination, and this overall suppression of motor function. Also, maybe if you've experienced this or noticed this in someone else, drinking alcohol tends to make you pee a bit more. The reason for this is that alcohol inhibits the secretion of a hormone called antidiuretic hormone that is secreted from this amazing structure called the pituitary gland. And maybe you've heard of a diuretic. A diuretic makes you urinate or pee more. So antidiuretic hormone tells your kidneys to hold on to more water, thereby creating less urine. So if you suppress this hormone, your kidneys won't hold on to as much water, causing more urine output and potentially leading to the dehydration that can occur with alcohol intake. The last structure I want to mention is the medulla oblongata. This is actually part of your brainstem, and it's an area that you don't really want to be suppressing much, as it controls basic vital life functions such as breathing, heart rate, reflexes like vomiting, and the gag reflex, which is important to help prevent you from choking. Now, alcohol's dangerous suppressing effects of the medulla obviously are going to come at higher levels of alcohol intake. But this is what is responsible for fatal cases of alcohol overdose, or sometimes referred to as alcohol poisoning. So why is it so detrimental to ingest higher levels of alcohol? Of course, we could say that, in general, the symptoms that we just discussed become worse at higher levels of alcohol intake, and in the case of overdose or poisoning, could even be fatal. But I want to come back to the liver in this pathway that we discussed earlier, and discuss what happens if we were to ingest more and more alcohol. As the liver cells have to take on and try to metabolize more alcohol, again, we could potentially overwhelm this metabolic pathway. We only have so many liver cells and so many enzymes and cofactors, but the liver cells can activate other pathways at higher levels of alcohol intake. One of them is referred to as the microsomal ethanol oxidizing system or pathway. I know that's a mouthful, but this occurs in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum of the liver cell, and it uses an enzyme called cytochrome P450. The names, again, aren't totally important here, but I'm a nerd, so I kind of had to mention those. But notice that, again, this pathway creates more acetaldehyde. But another byproduct of this pathway is reactive oxygen species, which you may have heard of as a type of a free radical. But these reactive oxygen species can damage cellular components, including DNA. So we're creating another substance that could potentially be a problem here. There also is another pathway for metabolizing alcohol, and that occurs in these organelles called peroxisomes. They utilize hydrogen peroxide and a different enzyme called catalase, but again, converts that alcohol into acetaldehyde. So notice what we've done here. The liver recruits other metabolic pathways as we ingest more and more alcohol. And this helps to a point, but we continue to get this conversion to acetaldehyde, which we know is more toxic than the alcohol itself. So this next step in the pathway becomes even more important. So let's say we are drinking high amounts of alcohol and producing more acetaldehyde than say we could recycle that NADH back to NAD and or we've maximized all the available aldehyde dehydrogenase. So you could see how this could cause a buildup of acetaldehyde in the liver, which could damage the liver cells, explaining why consistent intake of high amounts of alcohol could lead to liver disease such as cirrhosis and even increasing one's risk of liver cancer. Also, as an interesting FYI, some people have a genetic predisposition to produce less alcohol dehydrogenase and would therefore be more prone to accumulating more acetaldehyde with lower amounts of alcohol consumption. So how much alcohol is safe to drink? First, let's be clear about one thing. Everything that we've talked about today, plus all the science, the research, the data, it just shows that alcohol is toxic to the body. There's no way to really get around that. Does that mean you can absolutely never drink it? No, obviously not. As we've learned, the body does have mechanisms to clear itself of alcohol, but there are limitations to this as we've discussed. But again, can we come up with some guidelines on what are considered safe amounts of alcohol? Well, it's probably not gonna surprise you that there is some debate on this in the medical community, but the 2020 to 2025 Dietary Guidelines for Americans advises no more than two drinks per day for males and one drink per day for non-pregnant females. However, some experts are starting to challenge even that amount. And if you're trying to fully optimize your health, 
it's likely that no more than two drinks a week is best. And obviously, there's the choice of completely abstaining from alcohol intake, and then your body would never have to deal with metabolizing it. Also keep in mind that the safe dose tends to be lower in females than it does in males due to lower body size, having proportionally less water and more fat than males on average, and interestingly enough, women also tend to have less of that enzyme, alcohol dehydrogenase. And for some people, no level of alcohol consumption could be considered reliably safe, such as someone that is pregnant, a personal history of alcohol use disorder, or certain diseases of the liver and the pancreas. Now the point of this video was not to judge anyone for alcohol consumption. The goal was to provide anatomical and physiological information so that you could make your own informed decisions about your own alcohol consumption. And hopefully you found some of this information useful. And if you like learning about this, you might also like learning about what caffeine does to your brain. So if you're interested in learning more about caffeine in the brain, meet me over in this video, probably somewhere over in one of these corners. And of course, thank you for supporting our channel. Let us know what you thought of this video in the comments and I'll see you soon.